Boom. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this installment of the Crypto Oracle Collective call. We have a good guest for you today. But before we start, is there anyone new to the collective on the call? I don't think so, right? All right. Harry, is it pronounced Atlas or Atlas? Atlas. Spelt the Greek way. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Um, all right. Well, we have Atlas on the call today, a project in Regen, which is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite verticals in Web3. Um, let's see. Met, met with you guys, I think a couple of weeks ago at this point, were really impressed with their tokenomics, really impressed with, with how well thought out the, this project is. And so I'm excited that everyone is getting, going to get a chance to hear about them. So without further ado, Harry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, really excited to be on the call today to meet everybody and to tell you what we've been building, um, what we've got planned for the future and uh, answer any questions that anybody has. Um, I've got like 22 slides we can go through. We might speed through a couple of them. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we can return back to any slides that we that we speed through. Um, the goal I'm going to sort of go for today is to um, give a high level understanding of uh, what the technology is, the problem that it's solving, and hopefully for those who care how it works under the hood. Uh, so some of the uh, new balancing mechanisms we have and um, how the smart contracts work. Um, we'll also be talking a little bit about uh, TradFi as our, our protocol sits in between the DeFi and TradFi markets. So there might be some TradFi language in there. Um, again, guys, please feel free to interrupt, put your hands up. Tell me where you need me to clarify as we're going through. Um, let me give me a second. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay, present and share the screen. <clears throat> cool. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Cool. Yep. Yep. Should be in, yeah, we should be in full screen mode. Cool. So Atlas, what is Atlas? A market infrastructure for the digital asset era, um, starting with the digi digital voluntary carbon market. A couple of reasons why we're starting here, mostly because it's where our background is, um, but also because as a real world asset, it is uh, probably the easiest market to disrupt as it's incredibly nascent. So market size being 2 billion in 2020, uh, sorry, 500 million in 2020, 2 billion by 2022. So very fast growing market, but still for a global market, very, very small. Demand is locked in. Corporates have committed to the net zero. Companies have committed to net zero. The only way you get to net zero is um, by removing the residual emissions. However much you reduce, you must be removing uh, what we call the residual, which is what's left over after reduction. Um, so the demand is locked in, supply is limited, and the market is currently broken. Uh, so rather than trying to transform, say, the real estate market, which I think there's a fantastic use case for blockchain for, um, you are therefore, you're then disrupting a, a much older industry uh, with established players who are entrenched in their positions. Um, from our perspective in the voluntary carbon, two billion is a nice place to start. Projections are about 40 billion by 2030. If the 2 billion don't want to move, no problem. We'll capture the 38 billion that hasn't yet been established. So when we start to look at the uh, the voluntary carbon market as it stands today, this is a relatively oversimplified sort of diagram, but hopefully can illustrate the problems we have. Uh, unfortunately, some of the icons aren't, aren't loading in. We can thank pitch.com for that. Um, so on the supply side, pretty straightforward and simple. Investors provide capital to project developers. Project developers are people who plant trees, people who build uh, DAC uh, installments. DAC is a big fan, sucks air through, chemical process, abstracts the carbon dioxide. They are project developers who are creating the projects themselves, which sequester, remove, or reduce carbon. They then can create an asset, which is a carbon credit, which proves and ver verified proof that they have reduced or removed this carbon. That's the asset which they then sell. How do we know that it's an actual asset? What's the methodology that they used? Is it verifiable? Is it accurate? That's the job of the accreditor. So the accreditor, there are several in the market, main players at the moment being Vera Gold Standard, um, Biocarbon, and a few other places as well. As the market stands today, the exchange traded market is a very, very small component of the voluntary carbon market. Majority is traded OTC, 
OTC meaning over the counter, over the counter meaning blokes doing deals with blokes or ladies, um, with intermediaries like brokers, retailers, or marketplaces sitting in, rather than a centralized exchange, even if it's a decentralized exchange, but an, an exchange mechanism that sort of sits between two parties. The reason for this disconnection um, is due to the technology, which we'll touch on in a second. The, res the result of this disconnection is that you have the brokers connecting the exchange market with the retail, with the OTC market. As of 2023, um, pretty sure it was ecosystem marketplace, um, NGO, well-established in the market. They have the best market data because there's very little market data. Um, they have the for, for all the data from the brokers, um, brokers, exchanges, and all the different participants. They had 290 of the major ones. Um, the markup from what the end buyer pays versus what a broker pays on average in 2023 was 40%, which is huge, huge markup for, for what? For providing a liquidity service. I think someone wants to, to enter the call. I'll leave that for you guys to do. Um, so a huge markup for essentially uh, navigating through an analog and broken, broken market. <clears throat> so why is it broken? What's actually broken? What are the actual problems? Carbon credits are being treated like a traditional commodity, something that can be standardized, something that can be created um, or attempts to create fungibility that can then be uh, traded on an exchange. So we look at the standardized asset baskets, uh, what you might imagine in, say, uh, an asset basket in, say, grains, where you have uh, a few distinguishing features like Ukraine. Oh, sugar, there's a war going on. That's going to drop in price because there's a higher risk associated with it. The vintage in terms of when it's going to be delivered so ukraine 2014 and the grade right so it's, it meets at least the minimum grade of a that therefore they consider all the all the grain within that basket fungible so when you buy the ticker when you buy the standardized asset uh, basket or in DeFi language the pool token um you it doesn't matter which carbon credit you're redeeming or which uh, in this case grain you're redeeming that's not the case in carbon the, re the reason why uh, we're seeing um OTC being predominantly where people are trading is because higher quality projects who have potentially something called SDGs, which is Sustainable Development Goals set by the UN, um, you know, there's 17 of them, but for example, um, improving water quality in, in, in poor areas in Africa or in, in improving the infrastructure for, a, for a renewable energy or um, uh, educating uh, people uh, minorities and women who, who potentially don't have access to these. There's lots of different sustainability goals and there's certificates that you can achieve for that. So that's one example of another attribute that's currently not priced. Um, but there are lots of different factors, which we'll touch on in a minute later to, to explore the complexities of why it can't be fungible, or why the fungibility is difficult. And because we have this problem, we also have the blind in-kind delivery, i.e. because they're assuming everything is fungible, your pool token or your asset basket, you can't choose which underlying asset you want to redeem because why should you they're fungible but because we know they're not fungible it means that the higher quality projects lose their value due to the lowest common denominator effect it's a race to the bottom of that minimum criteria to go in um, for the dgens i like to uh the analogy i like to give is uh you're probably familiar with the nft liquidity pools um which provide liquidity to a specific nft project um you're not going to find uh, an NFT in there with a very rare attribute, uh, like a beanie, for example, simply because they're all priced exactly the same. They're considering it to be fungible. So it just sweeps the floor. It's a race to the bottom in terms of quality. And when you have a huge difference in quality uh, within an assets, like those liquidity pools, they serve a limited function in the market. And so what we see um, in terms of the base price is very disconnected. And we've started to see this price divergence in actual numbers. All the data we have on carbon market is outdated by a year because everything's super opaque. There's no transparent point. So we do rely on uh, some key market players to collect that data. But we saw the exchange prices drop 40% last year and OTC increase by 70%. So not even they're both, they're going opposite directions, right? So further proof the market is broken. Brokers, retailers love it. They're super happy. They're capitalizing on this inefficiency. They are solving a real problem and they're doing it in, a, in an analog way. Uh, and charging a lot of money for it. Um, the last point I have on here is marketplaces can't integrate in with this exchange and infrastructure because if they want to buy on an exchange, they've got to sit on, say, you know, 50,000 worth of assets and then sell them on. Right? They can't um, connect a seller and a buyer through a marketplace transaction, which is a hint. That's what we do. Um, so solution. 
we've got to make it digital. We can't be having PDFs that have been copied onto a, 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 a centralized ledger that you have to pay thirty thousand pounds to, to access, and of which the the PDF is just a recording of a bloke who's measured a tree two years ago. Not good enough. We need satellite data. Um, we need to have a real uh, live AI powered assessment on canopy heights and biomass changes that then give us the actual data so that we can create risk adjustment based portfolios. I, for example, if the project was estimated at a thousand tons, but actually we can see with the satellite, it's only 500 tons, we can just automatically risk adjust it. Or for example, now uh, we have, we have had uh, the new Argentinian uh, president, is it president or prime minister? I'm not quite sure. Um, who is uh, not, um, not particularly interested in limiting uh, limiting corporations in the country and, and definitely doesn't look favorably upon uh, green solutions. They might implement policies that reverse specific projects. So there's a risk of a policy there. Um, so we're working with partners to, to, to create those risk adjustments. But we need that data in there, not on a PDF format, but on a live digital data. And we need it to be interoperable with the OTC market, the over-the-counter, the marketplaces. So our product, as I said, we're, we're doing a voluntary carbon market first. So we've got the digital carbon ETFs. Our ETF structure can be applied to other assets though. When we look at the carbon uh, digital ETF, we can see there uh, just over here, DETF, and then all the underlying assets underneath. Unfortunately, the, the icons aren't loading. The icon here should be a little weight symbol because each individual project, even though the DTF is backed one-to-one -one with carbon, they're not redeemable one-to-one. -one. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. But it says it has the same minimum criteria. Mm -hmm. It's exchange tradable, just like the existing traditional, uh, someone else wants to join. Uh, it's exchange tradable, just like the existing infrastructure. It still provides benchmarking pricing. Um, but the two things that we're doing differently is we're incentivizing the quality projects, which are above the minimum threshold to also be deposited in here. And we are creating a yield bearing asset for investors as well. So it's a real yield, not a token based yield, um, which we'll touch on where that comes from in a second. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide a little bit and come back to it if anyone has any questions. Uh, we talked about the variety of different risks and the different um, the multitude of different attributes that make carbon credits non fungible. Um, and then essentially this slide we can talk through again if people are interested um, regarding how we mitigate those risks. Um, and the next slide also is showing you the, the, the bit that the reasons, but long story short, lots of different sources of risk, lots of different ways to bring data in to quantify those risks and then create a risk adjustment for those, uh, for, for those particular risks. When we look at how our DT, a, a digital ETF can be integrated into the OTC, OTC side, um, I want you to picture uh, an AMM within some oh, oh. of a I want you to picture an AMM within within a liquidity pool. So the liquidity pool itself can be traded on a DEX, like a normal sushi swap, Uniswap pair. We have the DETFA, let's say it's the ticker, paired with the USDC. Okay, fine, that's done. Within that liquidity pool, it has an additional AMM, right? Automated market maker. And the automated market maker is essentially allowing you to buy and sell every non-fungible asset that is within the DETF. So frustratingly the icons aren't loading for this but um the the core concept being uh, lots of different kinds of project represented by the colors you can see them then listed on the marketplaces they're all then individually listed and available on the marketplace a great example of how this already works today is say senken um senken are using on-chain carbon and every project is priced exactly the same because Every single project is redeemable one for one for its liquidity pool price, which is traded with the Uniswap with the uh, USDC. I think it's yeah US, USDC, I believe, on on Polygon, um, and the price of that pool token is the price of every single underlying asset. Um, when you have such great variance between the projects, which is the entire purpose of a marketplace to show you to be able to browse, to be able to see the different ratings of different projects, the permanence, the risks, um, why are they all priced the same? And also, you're not capturing the price for specific attributes. So how do we do that? Frustratingly, icons aren't here again. Um, is the automated market maker for the projects within within uh, within the ED digital ETF. So um, now I want you to, uh, for those who are familiar, picture a, a balancer pool where you have uh, static set weightings for specific to tokens within a balancer pool. Um, and then as the uh, balances of those tokens change, 
uh, the automated market maker for balancer will readjust the, the prices for those tokens. The bit that we're doing, which is so similar to that, the bit that we're doing is that the static weighting for a token, or in our case, a project, is dynamic. And the static weighting is then moved further down to an attribute level. And so what you're doing when you're creating the weightings for not, so it's a non-fungible pool, right? You're setting the weightings for what um, are the, uh, the drivers of price which are the, drive, the, the, the sources of risk. Um, for example, the, the vintage could be a source of risk. Uh, if you are an airliner, you can't buy before 2016 carbon. Can't do it. If you want to be Corsa compliant, which is the only reason an airline would buy it. Corsa is the industry body that regulates carbon. So you can't buy before 2016. Everyone else can't buy before 2013. That will probably move up to 2016. So if you've got a project which is 2017, you're just about to be not void you're not going to be able to sell this or if you're an asset manager you can't sell it so it's a depreciating asset right okay so we want to manage the risk around that um the specific region as we talked about with argentina another source of risk um the the different co-benefits do you want to be uh, does this project also have um you know sdg one two three and four which are set by the un um which could be clean water um industry industry growth etc etc and Keeping it simple here, but there's lots of different data points that we're pulling through. So satellite data is one, quantified biomass change two, and then BBB rating here. Uh, that's from a B0 partnership, which we have. They're a rating agency for carbon credits. Again, we can weight projects based on that. These are static weightings. And then using our weighting formula, they create the dynamic weighting for the specific project. And that would be equivalent to the balance of weight. So in practice, what happens when we just skip back to our marketplace slide, when, um, let's say we say project A and project B, if they share identical um, attributes, but there's only 10 of project A and 1,000 of project B, well, they're priced the same because the total weight for all of the attributes are the same. So it's the weighting for the number of attributes rather than the projects because you can have lots of different projects. They could be identical. Now, what if they've got one attribute that's different? Well, they'll be highly correlated. <clears throat> And so as the price of B, sorry, as the quantity of B changes, i.e. people like love this specific project, all the correlated projects, because they have this, the, what, the, the balance of the underlying uh, attributes are changing for every single project. So the dy dynamic weighting for every project with those attributes is also changing. So this is how we start to drive price discovery at an attribute level, which is where the pricing is coming from or the demand pressures are coming from for, from the buyers in the OTC market. Um, and how that links into a DTF is you're capturing the full value um, of what is being transacted on the OTC, uh, meaning that investors don't need to care about this. They don't really need to know how it works. There's a 2.5 spread. Um, so um, in DeFi terms, the, the liquidity fee, 2.5% for buying and for selling of the underlying projects. And that's the source of the revenue for the investors in the, in, in the digital ETF. Um, so hold on, we've got another request to join. Um, Yes, so um, our, our platform is um, is for investors to invest in in these in these digital ETFs to manage their portfolio. Uh, they may wish to claim um, uh, to, to redeem the carbon assets themselves and use our reporting tool to offset their own emissions. Which, um, to be frank, for for step one for us is is not super relevant. When it becomes relevant is in step two. And so the longer term vision for us is that we can integrate with and partner with other uh, tokenized asset providers, for example, metals, energy, grains, forest products, quantify the carbon emissions for every individual source of, say, metal, um, and create a net zero ETF for metals, a net zero ETF for energy, for grains, for forest products. The emissions that are quantified for these individual uh, commodities um, the digital ETF will then require the investment in one of the carbon DTFs uh, to represent a proportional amount of carbon that's removed. This is exciting, cool. We're creating a net zero commodity for buyers who, at the moment, it's very expensive for them to quantify what we call scope three emissions. Scope three is scope one, two, and three. Scope three are the emissions associated with the stuff you buy. So scope one is your lights in your office. Scope two, you know, people commuting to work. Scope three, and obviously there's lots more in there but scope three being your supply chain so what what are the, what are the emissions of your uh, of, of the metals you buy if you're tesla for example um 
that's expensive. So not only are we doing price discovery for the carbon projects themselves, it's price discovery for how how much a company will pay for a net zero version of this of this of this product. And then for the critics who uh, would argue that you're not decarbonizing, what you you're, you're just uh, you know putting a band aid on a solution. What we're doing here is we're creating a pricing mechanism for these assets or for these sustainable producers of these assets. So if we have miner A, miner B. Miner B wants to be super sustainable. Great. What's the commercial value for this? Where do they sell it? Okay, they can do an OTC trade. They can sell to um, to Tesla, and Tesla wants to do their reporting so they can continue to get their their um, the, the money from the US Gov. So, okay, they can do OTC, but is there an exchange place that they can transact? Okay, we can create just a purely um, uh, pure net zero, so only sustainable projects can go into. Then how do you quantify who's sustainable, who's not, and what level of quantification? Whereas what we're creating is a single liquidity pool or a single asset basket that any provider of metal can, can transact with, but the ones who are unsustainable have to pay a higher premium because they have to pay for more offsets for their carbon carbon projects, uh, for, for, the, for their emissions in their supply chain. Whereas the sustainable ones, they get to keep that premium. So now we're creating a premium for sustainable production. Um, yeah, the rest that we're going into sort of product roadmap, business model and stuff like that. Um, I probably use these to answer some questions. I'll probably answer, open the floor up now to anyone who has any questions. Um, yeah, and then I'll use this to, to answer this. Cool. Awesome. Yes, thanks for that. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. I asked all my questions when we met a couple of weeks ago, so I'll let other people have a chance to to ask. So I see Taco, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, one of the things that I just sort of wanted to touch on, Harry, thank you for the presentation and the time. Um, one, uh, when you were sort of talking about some of the DGEN play, I guess you could say, and like the asset management of financial instruments, is this something that someone would be able to create their own instrument? Like, I want this product, this product, and this product, and that makes token DYB, you know, type of thing, so that yeah, understood. you can sort of do their own piece and then whether or not that that's their own uh, DETF or does that become, I, I don't know, a derivative or, or, or what's that process there? And what does the regulatory piece look like? Sure. So from a regulatory perspective in the EU, um, we are exempt. So the, the regulation is, is MECA. Um, we're exempt from MECA. Uh, as long as we operate in a decentralized fashion as a, as a decentralized application. There are regulatory implications for uh, traditional finance partners uh, who wish to issue with Atlas, um, but they can, if they are MIFID compliant, uh, so that's the uh, uh, sort of financial regulations in the EU, they can grandfather that in and it's just essentially the same. Um, and there's a few additional requirements which we can help them with. So there's a white paper they need to do. To, um, there's a few small things that they need to do to to, to um uh, to, to be compliant, but they're very feasible. Um, in terms of the classification, um, we are not an asset reference token, um, even though that would you would assume by the name we are. The asset reference tokens refer more to the stable coins, and then you have e-money as well. We are a utility-based token because you're providing utilitarian access to the underlying assets. If we were to hold the assets off-chain, i.e. in an SPV, if we held the carbon credits in an SPV and uh, the the the, the the underlying assets weren't tokenized, then we would be considered an asset reference token. But because the assets are on chain, they are not tokenized by us. We are just creating the 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 access to that. Um, to answer your question, the first part, which was, uh, can other people deploy their own DETFs? Yes, um, as part of the platform, it won't be the first thing we launch. Um, but if they wanted to go into the smart contracts themselves, yes, they would be permissioned to do that. We will introduce that as well into our uh, platform at a later point. Um, I think it's going to be subject to product market fit. You know, I think that's what balance are kind of intended for theirs to be like portfolio management tool. And then it didn't transpire like that. And they just sort of centralized into sort of smaller liquidity pools. Um, I could see there being a use case here for people creating their own portfolios. Um, but I well, think like their own portfolio token almost. Yeah, exactly. And I, I could, I could see that like, like if somebody came, if we had a deal on the table and somebody wanted to bring in like, you know, 50 million in their asset manager, but they want their own token as, a, you know, got their name, which we have had a conversation about like that, we would totally be open to doing that. Um, I don't think we'll create the self onboarding UI for it um, as a first instance. 
Okay. And so then since you're going to be follow, following under Mika and stuff like that, um, from a user standpoint, if I want to come use your platform, do I have to KYC to be able to buy and trade these? So um, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. So um, first deal we have on the table is with the decentralized fund. Um, they're DAO managed. Uh, they don't they don't have any KYC requirements. Uh, we have another deal on the table with a large EU player. Everything has to be KYC'd. Um, so depends on which DETF that you'd be interacting with, essentially, to answer right. the question. And does that does that require someone to also buy an entire token to to participate, or you know they're they're having to buy block pieces, or what does it look like from a user standpoint that wants to get involved in some way, shape, or form? Sorry, could you? Say that again. Uh, random user comes to your site. Yeah, they can they connect their wallet. How do they yep. give you money, and and what's their minimum requirement to give you money? Got it. Basically, yeah, got it. No minimums. Um, uh, it would be connect wallet and uh, deploy capital into ETF. ETF then deploys the capital in because yeah. the DETF is balanced with cash and carbon, and so you're just changing the pool. And it, it, essentially, it's then its job is to then automatically deploy deploy the capital in the OTC market, buy carbon credits to then rebalance um, the projects, but versus the cash. Okay, and so then so, I mean, you could do a dollar if you wanted to. Yeah, and then at some point, and what chain are you building on? Uh, so on? in. Uh, initial initial PFC will be in Polygon because there's tokenized carbon there, um, and we're working on um, like cross chain or, or proof of stake. Uh, proof of stake, simply because okay. that's where the, the tokenized carbon is. It's not uh, as we are market infrastructure. We have to go where the assets are. Um, we're we're going to have a deployment. Um, everything going well. <laughs> we will also have a deployment on a bank DLT, um, which is in the TradFi space. And then we're looking at Concordium um, as well as a potential. Um, if it was down to me, I'd probably go ZK Poly. Um, but the next source of carbon is OFP, uh, Open Forest Protocol. They're deployed on Near, And then we've also got Regen, which are deployed on Cosmos. Um, so regardless of our personal preferences, we are infrastructure. We have to go where the assets are. Um, or where the cash is, so bank DLT for cash. Um, what we're working on now for our V2 is the in, the cross-chain communication, so we can have assets held on multiple chains, but then uh, we can have a central chain as a home, as a sort of uh, who, wheel and spoke mechanism. Um, who, are you, who are you integrating for your tech partner for cross-chain messaging? Uh, still part of V2. We're looking at it now. We're meeting with Axel our next week. Um, <laughs> yeah and uh but i'm 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 commercial and product so you'd probably have to speak to my cto stefan no, he's yeah. next consensus next microsoft it's much smarter than uh, axlar gets you access to the cosmos ecosystem pretty much everything evm um and then into polka dot as well um nice. there is a couple refi regen refi uh chains building out within polka dot and obviously cosmos um you know uh yeah so um, I guess then what, what are some of your roadblocks right now? Bumps in the road? What's holding you back from being amazing and ever being on uh, and what's holding you back from being on, on in everyone's uh, head? Sure. Um, I'd say uh, two blockers. One, the resources to grow the dev team um, to be able to build the V2 with cross chain. Uh, and then two, we need to um, we need to bring in outside capital um from the tradfi market and track uh, sort of well it could be DeFi capital but we essentially need liquidity for for the digital etfs to be able to deploy the capital all the project developers from the carbon side we speak to they're like great sounds good i get instant capital i can maximize my revenue and we have lots of tools to maximize the revenue for them but they're like when how where's the money so they're on board we've already got them partnered up um it's the launch liquidity that we need. Um, and then to scale for V2, we need uh, to raise cash for developing. Uh, so how much liquidity are you are you needing to turn this into your perpetual motion machine? How much are you raising? So we're raising for our seed um, presently 1.2 um, for development. And then for the liquidity side, it, it depends on which route we go. So first deal on the table we've got is a, 21 21 million dollar fund of carbon that's tokenized carbon on chain 
um, deals not done, uh, working with them to to try to get that on, that would be sufficient to start on the on the de on the um, non permission side. Second deal on the table is much much larger and it's going to take much longer. Um, and they're looking at an initial deployment of 50, 50 million um, of liquidity. Um, but commercial guys and ESG guys in in, in the TradFi company I'm talking about are on board. They see the money. They see excited. We're at the compliance, legal, and risk team where they've got their books open, looking for reasons to say no. Um, and so we're now uh, onboarding, and the sort of blocker there is, is onboarding a CLO and, and regulatory side to ease their concerns and get get, get us through the door there. Um, I, <clears throat> cool. Um, I have a ton of more questions, but I, I, I see Charles has his hand out, and, and, and Eric, and I don't want to... We'll, we'll come back to you, Taco, don't worry. And I didn't mute you. I think you muted yourself, um, just so you know. <laughs> uh, Charles, go ahead. Hi, um, Harry. Thanks for that presentation. That was absolutely great. Um, it's fascinating what you're doing. Um, I'm I'm in Brazil. It might not sound like it from the accent. I was actually born where you are right now. Uh, nice. I grew up there, but I've been in Brazil for uh, over 37 years. Um, mm. And I've been, my focus in the last 20 years has been in forestry investments and, and processing forestry and so on. Um, when they came up with the you know, Red 2 and so on, it, it, one of the things one realizes is that it's incredibly subjective, the whole process, and it still is. Um, yes. And that, that's, to me, the difficulty with the, with the voluntary credits. One sort of feels, and you know, forgive me if there's somebody listening who, who is on, on an, uh, has a different viewpoint, but it just seems to me incredibly rigged. You know that the the consultants are, are in bed with the politicians who are in okay. bed with the, so on and so forth. You know, so there's not really any any great transparency. So that that's one issue. I mean, I got like <laughs> like my colleagues 101 uh, uh, questions, but so that's one thing. Um, and w what are you doing to to make that more transparent or make it more understandable for people who want to buy and sell stuff? Because there's no shortage mm -hmm. of people. To buy and buy and sell it, I believe, but you know, they nobody can really get their hand heads around a standardized thing, and uh, so that's one thing. And the other uh, would be uh, on the forestry side, obviously, would be the bi biochar. Uh, I don't know if you saw Bill Gates shoved you know twenty million or fifty million into into a company called Graphite, um, which is most extraordinary because they're basically processing trees. Nothing wrong with that if you planted them in the first place. Um, turning them into sawdust and scrunching them into little bags and burying them underground. I mean, great idea for being carbon negative, but actually you could use the same material to turn into building bricks or blocks, substituting mm -hmm. concrete blocks and so on. And actually we're looking at something. I mean, I'm doing some development on that in, in Brazil, um, but I'm not aware of anybody who's done a, a VCM um, you know, credit on that basis of, of, you know, for building materials and so on. But I may, may be wrong, the world's a big place. But anyway, I could go on talking for an awfully long time. Um, sure. can, can you give us your your input onto those two elements, you know, the sort of the, the transparency element and also the biochar, yeah. what credits you've looked at or with biochar? I think, so yeah, I can I can definitely talk to both those points. So um, first side, I'm, I'm going to summarize with the word integrity. Um, in terms of the actual assets themselves, not in terms of the people doing it. Um, what's the integrity of those assets? Um, this is uh, this is one of the driving factors for the separation or disconnect between exchange markets and OTC markets because there is a lack of integrity. You type into Google carbon credits or voluntary carbon market, the first thing you see is fraud, second thing you see is fraud, third thing you see is fraud. Two out of three are fraud. The third one is probably just a dodgy calculation. And so... Um, uh, you're, you're in the space, so I'll, I'll speak in a little bit more detail, um, uh, which, which is really nice. Uh, essentially, like aggressive baselines. So they're like when they're doing the the red projects, where they're saying, um, "Well, we're not going to cut these trees down, um, and if we did cut them tree, trees down, this was the rate of deforestation, and that rate is way higher than what's actually relevant." So that's just to translate for other people what a baseline is, right? So what's the baseline of deforestation? Well, we've promised not to cut it down, so therefore it stayed the same. That's the difference. And then that's how they get their carbon credit number. And then when you do the analysis of the baseline, you're like, well, nothing else is being cut down or it's like way less being cut down. Well, then you have far less carbon credits. They've overcredited or they've over issued the number of credits they have. Whereas like it gets labeled as fraud. It's like, yeah, maybe they knew, maybe it is fraud. Um, either way, the assets are being labeled as one carbon ton is incredibly misleading. 
it's an estimate of one ton. And how do you get to that estimate? What's the calculation? Who's verifying it? And so this is the part of the product where if I just share my screen again quickly, um, Brave tab, there we go, product, there we go. Uh, where we go onto the uh, risk adjustment side, um, where we look at like the, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, so um, on the overcrediting risk, so more credits being issued than is actually achieved. Um, there are lots of other risks in this as well. So leakage risk. Okay, let's say you've got your baseline correct. You didn't do anything wrong. And let's say you've promised to not cut down this land here. And then the, 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 the forest cutters have just literally cut everything around it. Have you actually increased the decreased the rate of deforestation in the area <coughs> as a whole? Or just for the bit you promised not to cut down? Did you actually make an impact? Or did it just leak? elsewhere so what's the the area that they're doing the catchment of that non-permanence risk like we talked about argentina potentially they're going to reverse a specific um or put laws in place that essentially put make it void additionality um a great example for additionality was like let's say you've promised not to cut down this land great we can sell the carbon credits but is it inside of a national park meaning that it was never going to be cut down in the first place? Did the money actually create additional risk, uh, addition, additional carbon? And so all of these are sort of the risk factors. Um, and they're for people who are much smarter than me to, to analyze and for the scientists to analyze. And so um, we are working with the partners who are doing that analysis. Um, but I'll, I'll get onto that in a second to, to continue answering your question. None of this is captured by the exchange uh, asset baskets that we currently have. It's just like, it's carbon. Yes, it's carbon. Oh, and it's in it's in Argentina, and it's from 2014. And that's the extent of it, right? There's there's no uh, grade rating. There's no um, quantification. So um, that's why the majority is moving to the OTC market because we saw, like in the last two years, where um, as you said, I said, you type into Google, it's fraud. The, the Guardian articles that come out. Um, buyers still buy are still buying carbon credits. Yes, it has slowed down in the last year, but they're still buying, and those who are buying are too scared to buy on exchange and so they want to do all of the due diligence themselves on a project they want to verify the impact of these projects and then we're starting to see now that the the more hesitant buyers are using b0 planet silvera d climate all of the guys on the right here to do that due diligence for them and then they're willing to buy those projects but the only way you can do that is on the OTC market where you can see a specific project. We don't have anything that bundles those together yet. And that's the bit that we're, hope, that we're, that we're planning on solving. Um, your second part of your question was, um, was what, sorry, could you remind me again? So just if, you, if you've done anything with biochar. With biochar. Or yeah, great question. So um, our first issuance is on uh, Polygon POS because that's where Toucan, uh, who are a carbon tokenizing bridge, um, have 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 issued their carbon or their their their, their tokenized versions of carbon. They've just um, integrated with Puro, who I believe are primarily focused on biochar for the VCM. Um, so um, that there's a clear path uh, to and Puro are like a, a competitor. Um, if we go back to slide three, Puro are the accreditor. So they're an accreditor for I'm pretty sure for biochar. Um, and then also we've got uh, Kita, who are a carbon insurer for biochar. They're both focusing on this. Um, and yeah, I guess slightly adjacent comment, biochar is is very, very popular at the moment in the voluntary carbon market. Um, I'd say popular to talk about, um, still not the majority, it's still not popular in terms of transactions, although our data is six months outdated. Um, but every conference, every uh linkedin post it's all talking about biochar as, as a strong carbon removal process that has high um high um uh, additional benefits on sort of like the sdg sides because you're improving soil culture um which is uh well, obvious benefits for the food for the, for the agricultural side um so it's looked upon favorably okay no listen that, that, thank you for that very kind answer just last point i don't want to uh, um Take whatever all the time. Um, I mean, personally, I you know I think the whole red mechanism was too, totally misguided. They should simply pay everybody for keeping native standing forests, or and which would be one price. And if it's a national park, we'll just pay it to the government. So the price would be a bit lower, but at least it would be completely transparent, and the market would be completely you know there would be a much bigger market and it'd be much better. But they didn't do that because the politicians wanted to make it clever. <laughs> so that they 
line their friends' pockets who was a consultant and this and that and the other. But that's me uh, from a cynical point of view. And um, anyway, listen, I'd love to to follow up with you. Um, I, I guess you're on LinkedIn or something, but if you can send an email or something in the chat, that would be great. If you'd have some time, perhaps I could uh, we could follow up on a Zoom or something if that was convenient. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put my LinkedIn and my email now in the feed so anyone can reach out with any questions. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to take any more time. It's too selfish. No worries. The, only, the only additional Very comment nice. I'll make, the only additional oh. comment I'll make there is just the distinction between the different types of carbon credits. So you've got like the, and, and one of the comments, Sorry, I was talking, but I'd muted myself. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to distinct, add a distinction in terms of the different carbon credits that are in the market. So uh, LinkedIn and my email in the chat there. So um, a lot of people I speak to, we talk about a voluntary carbon market and we talk about regulatory market. Well, why, why, why not just focus on the regulatory market? It's regulated, it's easier. The regulatory market is a cap and trade system. So the completely non-financial analogy here is imagine you've got you know 10 people all throwing 100 cans a day on the street trash rubbish and you said all right you can only throw 60 but if you throw 50 you can give your allowance of 10 extra cans to someone else to throw you haven't reduced the amount of cans that are going on the road you've just moved it around you're allowing people to admit and like i like the concept of rubbish because we all have like we're, we're all comfortable with the idea of paying for trash like I produce, you know, I'm, 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 I'm like a, say, a, a, an iron uh, refiner. I get slag. Where do I put that stuff? Where do I, where do I, where do I dispose of my physical waste? When well, we're talking about carbon dioxide, is an emissions-based waste, and so carbon voluntary carbon market will change name to verified carbon market or be integrated in somehow, um, but it's the removal of carbon dioxide from the air or the avoidance of carbon being emitted. Um, so avoidance being promising not to cut the trees down, removals, which is definitely where the market sentiment is moving because it's far higher integrity, which is plant the trees that actually sequester the carbon. So I am taking out what I have put in um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a mechanism. Um, reduction still has its place and it still is the majority of the market uh, from market cap size or from pure volume metrics. Um, from sentiment wise, the market's moving to removals, I think. That's really cool. Um, Eric, you're up. Great, uh, Harry, nice to meet you. Thanks for presenting to us. Um, I, I, I like this space a lot in, in general tokenized assets, but the rub is always liquidity. So talk, dig in a little bit on the liquidity side for me. Uh, that's usually where I see most of the problems. So who who's gonna provide liquidity for these markets? Who who have you targeted? What's their sentiment? Um, how fast do you think that's gonna move? Um, what's the story in general there? Sure. Um, so um, when you're when you're talking about liquidity, you're saying liquidity for our protocol rather than the market as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Specific, let's start with what you can control, which is your protocol. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got you. So um, I think that, sorry, actually, no, I think a better way to be was where's the liquidity currently in the market and where can we, so where can we extract it from and pull it into our protocol? The, sure. a, a large part of the liquidity is, is within the brokers themselves. And so the brokers are holding um, and trading carbon because they can put their 40% margin on it. Um, and so you have lots of, <coughs> excuse me, you have lots of brokers who have, um, who have liquidity. You also have, um, the, if, if we, if we picture back to that, um, flow chart of the, of the current market, sorry, I had, I need to cough. Mm. Sorry, December weather is kicking in. Um, so Yes, so investors who are investing in the projects themselves that are then looking to liquidate their, their 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 carbon into the marketplace. They are one source of liquidity. Even though it's not cash liquidity, it's the carbon assets themselves. They're looking for a sales uh, channel. The uh, brokers themselves are looking for a sales channel. Currently, the way that they do their business is um, with... Uh, direct deals with corporates this is another sales channel we're essentially aggregating the demand from marketplaces and so we're uh, marketplaces like senken marketplaces like carbon mark uh, there's lots of traditional non uh, uh, web3 versions we 
bridge those two. So you've got um, like the the Shopify plugin marketplaces. You've got the uh, carbon accounting softwares like for shipping for um, like if you're shipping a product from A to B, they calculate the emissions and then provide you an offset. That's called Patch. It's a company, but they're essentially a marketplace or a broker, tech-enabled broker marketplace. Um, so it's about for us onboarding the demand and then the supply, there's plenty of it. At the moment in the market, we have an over um, overabundance of supply because of the last year of people panicking uh, from the integrity side. Um, and so I think that for us to bring in the liquidity rather than bringing in the cash, it's about bringing in the carbon credits, bringing in the demand and showing the yield. Um, and so uh, we are working with, or you know, we're in the final stages of the deal with a tokenized asset manager, carbon asset manager. They've got... Um, 21 million in, in tokenized carbon that is currently sitting in a different liquidity pool, um, which they are being charged, or well, the marketplaces are being charged 25% to redeem any underlying asset. Um, the justification for this 25% is to clean up the shit carbon, excuse my language, at the bottom of the pool, uh, which in my opinion is just a fee for the incompetency or, or the lack of good technology. Uh, so we're solving that. These guys have seen it. It's a direct competitor's biggest client, um, and so we need to we need to win that deal. Um, but then that also gives us a sort of kicking off point to prove the yield and to show that it's a real yield. We're not issuing any tokens to create the yield. The yield is from charging a liquidity fee, um, and then from there we're moving into the tradfi space. There's a lot of money in the tradfi space for uh, green bonds, um, and that's where we'll be able to bring. Um, uh, cash liquidity rather than carbon liquidity. Um, so for our go-to-market strategy, it's about bringing carbon liquidity in. We've got project developers who are sitting on carbon trying to sell it. That is liquidity. It's not cash, but it's liquidity. Um, and so getting it tokenized, getting it on the platform is sort of step one. Integrating in the marketplaces, already have them uh, ready to go once we've got the liquidity. So... Um, and uh, that proving the yield, and then translating this into a digital green bond, which we can issue with one of the TradFi partners. Um, for them, the reason why TradFi are excited about green bonds is, is they, um, sorry, companies who are investing in, uh, sorry, funds who are investing in uh, green assets, they have uh, commitments to their LPs or to their um, the people who have invested in them as funds to allocate a specific section of money towards green assets, towards ESG positive assets. It's part of the money is already committed to this and they need to find a place for it. Um, and so there's there's a reasonable amount of excitement um, for, from the space, at least. That that's our high level plan. Um, I think we need, I think we need, um, I think we need help on the navigating the tradfi space. And so we're working at the moment to try to to solve that piece. Um, we've got a couple of very eager brokers who want to help us bring this to market, and we're trying to figure out the right one. Um, uh, but we, yeah, okay. long-winded way. Thank, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that explanation. That's, that's a little bit better situation than most of the tokenized, uh, real world asset players are in. So, so good luck with that. I think, I think that's a little bit better story than normally, than I normally hear. <laughs> All right. I'll yeah. move on. Cool. I think we have time for one more and I'm sure you'll be getting emails um, cause I think there's some people on this call who want to help, um, us. Um, Hey, um, I actually signed up for your beta and I have a couple of questions. Um, your market maker, can that be stapled onto an exchange? Sorry, could you, your again, market, like... your market maker technology, can that be, can that be integrated with an exchange? Um, Short answer, yes. Um, I think I probably need to understand the question a little bit more. So the automated market maker is within an asset, uh, which we call the DETF, which can be traded on an exchange. Um, okay. And so if it's a decentralized exchange like Uniswap or SushiSwap, where you've got the liquidity pool token or the DETF token uh, paired with the USDC, Mm -hmm. You can then do a swap path all the way through from our AMM through to the, the liquidity pool token so that you're then integrating in the purchase of that LP token, redemption of the asset for the LP token, and then retiring that. So that would be the, 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 the flow chart for, say, a marketplace who is looking at all the underlying assets within the DTF, presenting it neatly on their marketplace with individual prices that they've pulled from our API or from the smart contract. 
Um, uh-huh. And then when they go to purchase it, they're then buying the DTF trading token on a Uniswap or SushiSwap pair, redeeming the underlying credit that the, the purchaser has chosen for the ratio set by the weighting to get the underlying asset. So they're using both the, the DEX and the SEX. Um, if we were to use a, a centralized exchange on the SEX, um, the automation side is 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 not as simple because it's gated by them rather than by us. Um, uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, yeah. that makes sense. Um, uh, so the last question is, um, we're working with the state of New York, which has put a bunch of guidelines in place for um, for basically carbon credits that people are going to have to either acquire or figure out how to custody in the next couple of years as an offset against uh, rising power costs. Um, do you have any mechanisms for, for custody um, for the retail consumer? Sorry, when you say custody, um, like our technology is non-custodial uh, for the DeFi side. Mm-hmm. Um, when you say custody, can you just help me understand what you mean by that? Right. If they were buying your tokens or if they were, you know, because the, the, we're looking at a couple different offset models right now, whether it's like carbon-backed NFTs or a variety of other things um, to facilitate this. And then we're talking to some of the state regulators. The regulators are complete Luddites. Um, they don't understand anything of this market in any capacity whatsoever. And it's it's a it's sort of like huge hill for us to climb. Um, but the, the biggest thing that they asked about was the the ability to to basically say, OK, well, you know, Joe Consumer wants to do wants to buy an offset because his house isn't a carbon sink. It's actually carbon positive. Um, and then they want to facilitate a custody mechanism. Um, I'm just curious if you guys have anything like that because we're we're actually looking at building one. Um, but there's, I just see a bunch of synergies. So I mean, the rest of this I can take offline with you. Yeah, yeah, I got I got your email. I found your LinkedIn. Uh, thank thanks for thanks for dropping that um, for the the beta. Um, I'm I'm not sure I'm still un- understanding the the custody requirements, but let me try to to answer that. Um, so. Uh, Custody could be, you could be referring to at the point of tokenization. So taking the off-chain assets issued on Vera, PRO, or whatever, uh, a creditor, the act, uh-huh. the custody of the carbon credit, uh, those are, are are put into either managed by the registry or managed by the tokenizing bridge, an, S, an SP, uh, SPV, a uh, special purpose vehicle, and then tokenized accordingly. Um, we have plans to do this. It's not incredibly difficult, um, especially in, in the UK. We've just had... Um, uh, the tokenization of funds, uh, so not funds being dollar funds, but like a fund. Uh, the tokenization of the shares of that fund is now mm-hmm. uh, permissible and green lighted by the UK Financial Conduct Authority. So we we, we can do it here. Um, in terms of custody of the digital assets after like post tokenization, um, at the, the the DETF is a liquidity pool, so it's non custodial, but it's it's holding those assets with with a proportional ownership being owning the DETF. Um, is, is that what you mean by custodian? That's that's exactly what I'm referring to. Okay. Uh, Sean said yes. Because the, um, the, state, the state is looking at it in a weird way, which is that, you know, individuals would have to custody the offsets. Um, and what we're looking into is, you know, what's the, the best methodology by which to actually facilitate that? Yeah, happy to take this offline. Um... We could probably build. Sorry, I have to cough. We have. We could probably build like a custom uh, DETF or a private DETF, um, which could solve some of the needs. From the custodial side, we could use a partner, or we could deploy um, a UK-based SPV with tokenization. Um, it depends on the source of assets. They might already have a tokenization path through Thalo or, to- or Toucan. Or, or no, fair. Could... We're and we're we're going through a couple different accreditation processes to kind of like suss that out. So. Yeah, I'll reach out to you via email, but thanks. Cool. Very cool. Well, we are over time, so thanks, everyone. And I'll see everyone in two days. Nice. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Thanks, Harry. Thanks. Guys, feel free to reach out to me. I'll answer any questions. I'm on, I'm on send, online all night. Send you an email and LinkedIn and then all the requests. You should add a. <laughs> you should re- add a all button under the request form too. Unless they're all uh, separate. Yeah. Yes, I see. Gotcha. All right. On the on the on the beta request, you mean? 
Yep. Got it. Good feedback. Taco wants to experience all of it. <laughs> Have a great day, night, Thank morning, everybody. Talk Have a great day. Soon. Bye. Bye-bye.